In 1981, Apple Computer was the leader in the growing billion dollar PC industry. That year, they had an install base of over 300,000 Apple Ones, good for 20% market share, and sales were growing 50 to 100% a year. But that same year saw the introduction of the IBM PC, and with that, Apple's fortunes rapidly began to decline. Apple needed a follow-up to its first big hit. Making one turned out to be a seriously difficult journey. In this video, we're going to talk about Apple's struggle to survive the IBM PC onslaught. But first, let me talk about the Asianometry Patreon. Early access members get to see new videos and selected references for those videos before the release to the public. It helps support the videos and I appreciate every pledge. And I recently added an annual subscription option too. Thanks and on with the show. What was then called the microcomputer, today your basic desktop PC, begins with the integrated circuit, more specifically the microprocessor. A computer needs memory and logic chips. In the 1970s, advances in semiconductor manufacturing made these chips both widely available and quite affordable. When you do that, special things happen. In 1974, Intel released the Intel 8080. Capable of addressing 64 kilobytes of memory, it became the standard for 8-bit devices. It wasn't the only one on the market. Notable peers include Zilog's Z80 and Motorola's 6800, but its wide availability helped make the microcomputer possible. That same year, out in New Mexico, electronics tinkerer Ed Roberts needed a new product for his calculator kit company. The company, named MITS, couldn't profitably produce calculators anymore thanks to the calculator wars. So Roberts puts together a cheap computer kit called the Altair 8800, negotiating a volume deal with Intel for the 8080 microprocessors to power it. The little computer cost about $395 in kit form, or 621 assembled. After the magazine Popular Electronics featured it on its January 1975 cover, the computer sold like gangbusters. The Altair essentially founded the $5.5 million microcomputer industry, yet MITS could not meet demand allowing other companies with more compelling products and business savvy to overtake it. Apple was one of those companies. In April 1977, at the first West Coast Computer Fair in San Francisco, Apple introduced their Apple II computer. Their first computer, the Apple I kit computer, was more like a circuit board for hobbyists, but it sold enough, about 200 units, to prove the business model and warrant a more polished successor. The Apple II was described at the time as an appliance computer, a completed system that you can buy off the retail shelf, take home, and use. The computer looked professional and aesthetically pleasing. It came in a plastic case with a built-in keyboard, a color monitor made possible by a nifty bit of engineering by co-founder Steve Wozniak, and a version of BASIC stored on its chip. Very importantly, it featured eight expansion slots for easy upgrades and add-ins from third-party companies. Called boards or cards, you can enhance your Apple II's display, memory, or sound capabilities. Wozniak added the system after winning an argument with his colleague, Steve Jobs. One last thing, the Apple II used MOS Technologies' 6502 microprocessor, based on a Motorola 6800 design, rather than an Intel 8080. This happened at the time simply because of money. When Wozniak was putting together the original Apple I, he grabbed the 6502 rather than the 8080 because the former cost $25 and the latter $179. The decision turned out to be a fateful one. It meant that Apple's operating systems and software would develop and grow separately from the Intel microprocessor ecosystem. The Apple II sold very well right off the bat, generating $750,000 in sales at the end of the 1977 fiscal year. But it was not the only player in the growing microprocessor market. Other notable microcomputers at the time included the Commodore PET, also exhibited at the fair, and the Tandy TRS-80, sold by the Radio Shack retail stores. Competition was fierce, but in 1978 Apple released a technical update by Wozniak that leapfrogged the Apple II ahead of its competitors. Even today, users are always wanting more memory. Apple President Mike Markula wanted to use a checkbook program, but the computer's tape cassette memory took two minutes to load data from memory and another two minutes to write to it. In 1977, computers were transitioning from tape cassette memory to floppy disk drives, but making floppy drives reliable was immensely challenging. 
previous microcomputer companies like Processor Technology failed and subsequently folded. In December 1977, Markula held a meeting with some product goals. Floppy disk was number one. Back then, Wozniak didn't know much about how drives worked other than once flipping through a manual about them. But he decided to spend the holiday season producing a brand new disk drive controller responsible for controlling the flow of data in and out of the disk drive. He tore through documentation from various vendors and crafted a design of his own. This entirely new disk drive controller, the integrated WAS machine, used far fewer components and outperformed far more expensive systems. It remains one of his crowning engineering achievements. News leaked that Apple would introduce a disk drive at the 1978 Consumer Electronics Show in the first week of the year, and everyone came to see it. News about Waz's disk drive achievement reached two programmers, Dan Bricklin and Bob Frankston. They already liked the Apple II over the PET and the TRS-80, nicknamed the Trash-80 for good reason, because it was more open and good for games. But the disk drive news really spurred them to move forward with developing their new visual spreadsheet concept, VisiCalc for the Apple II first. Exclusive to the Apple II for the first year, VisiCalc became one of the first examples of a killer app. It sold 200,000 copies in two years. Businesses were willing to pay thousands to buy an Apple II just to use this spreadsheet software. Apple could have owned the software themselves. Before its wide release in 1979, VisiCalc co-author Daniel Filstra showed it to Apple and offered to sell it to them for $1 million dollars. They turned it down. Nevertheless, Apple II sales went exponential. By 1980, Apple had sold over 100,000 of them, generating $100 million in revenue and giving them over 15% market share of the growing personal computer industry. IBM noticed a potential negative impact that VisiCalc equipped Apple IIs would have on its sales. A $100,000 revenue business can expense a $5,000 microcomputer over five years at about 1% of annual sales. Back then, a large corporation, IBM's bread and butter, would spend about 2% of their revenues on data services. So in theory, IBM could possibly lose half their future sales to these microcomputers. IBM CEO Frank Carey decided that IBM needed its own microcomputer produced outside of the company's traditional bureaucracy. He pulled together a small team in Boca Raton that eventually produced the IBM PC. The PC was a guerrilla project put together with off-the-shelf components, including a PC-DOS operating system from Microsoft and an 8088 microprocessor from Intel. Very unusually for them, the only parts that IBM sourced on its own were the keyboard and the basic input-slash-output system chip, or BIOS. The IBM team did not take out any significant patents or the like. Similar to the Apple II, the PC had a modular expandable architecture with components assembled onto boards. Customers can upgrade their machines and specialist suppliers can enter the market with a component like a video card or a disk drive without having to build a whole machine. Project director Philip Donald Estridge owned an Apple II and was impressed with expandability. He insisted that the IBM PC have a modular bus system and not design any of their own add-ons. This approach might have been revolutionary to IBM, but not to the industry as a whole. I mean, Apple put together the Apple II the same way. The PC also came with a library of third-party software. This included VisiCalc itself, which sold more copies on the IBM PC than on any other platform, including the Apple II. But then came the ultra-popular spreadsheet app Lotus123 and the word processing app WordStar, two killer apps which established the IBM PC has a truly useful tool for the business world. Apple had long known that the IBM PC was coming, but their fears about the juggernaut IBM entering the market were counterbalanced by skepticism that this stodgy company would ever be capable of anything particularly innovative. Some other people were optimistic that an IBM PC would validate the market and lend it credibility. It might even create a rising tide lift all boats situation. Now it is here. Company employees sought to show a brave face. President Mike Markula said, We've been planning and waiting for IBM to get into the marketplace for four years. We are the guys in the driver's seat. We are the guys with one-third of a million installed base. We are the guys with a software library. We are the guys with distribution. It's IBM who is reacting and responding to Apple. Steve Jobs said, It's curious to me that the largest computer company in the world couldn't even match the Apple II, 
which was designed in a garage six years ago. He also said, we are going to outmarket IBM. We got our stuff together. But he didn't say stuff. Such attitudes eventually led to Apple's infamous full-page ad in the Wall Street Journal, welcoming IBM into the PC market. Ballsy considering that IBM was many times larger than Apple, commanding a titanic marketing budget and a powerful direct sales force. Released in August 1981, the IBM PC was a near instant and unexpected success. The company predicted that it would sell about 200,000 units in the first year and 1 million over three years. They beat these forecasts by at least 500%. They sold about 50,000 units by the end of the year. IBM struggled to keep up with demand for their hit, shipping just 13,533 units from August to December 1981. There were massive backlogs. But by the second year in 1984, supply caught up, and IBM was soon selling 200,000 units a month. The IBM PC surged from nothing to seizing a third of the market. Apple still sold a whole lot of computers, and those sales would grow. But their microcomputer market share would erode from 20% to 11% by 1984, good for second place. To sell the PC, IBM copied the microcomputer makers and brought the computer to retail outlets like Sears and Computerland, turning away from its traditional sales force. And they backed it with the full might of the IBM machine with its 400,000 employees, 40 billion in revenue, and 6 billion in profits. Such a company can easily fund a marketing campaign to annihilate any competitor. Now the first generation microcomputer makers have to compete with IBM, sitting right on the shelves alongside them. How can they survive? Commodore Texas Instruments and other contemporary microcomputer makers stampeded to avoid the IBM giant. By August 1982, Commodore and TI had cut prices of their computers to under $200. That December, Atari cut prices of their budget microcomputer, the Atari 400, to under $200. The company could not handle the financial repercussions of doing so and collapsed, losing $500 million and laying off thousands in 1983. This left Commodore and TI as the remaining big players in the low-end space. In January 1983, Commodore cut the price of its top-end Commodore 64 microcomputer all the way down from $600 to $200. TI could not handle the bleeding any longer. They announced a $100 million loss, its president resigned, and they exited the microcomputer business. Apple needed to do something, but what to do? One of Apple's failures leading up to the IBM PC was its inability to expand its product line. At the start, the microcomputer space largely targeted hobbyists, home users, and education. The Apple I and II were built for those customers. But the Apple II accidentally and unexpectedly found its stride with small business users. Most Apple customers of this type were small offices run by professionals, doctors, lawyers, and consultants. Most of them used their Apple II for word processing, accounting, and data management services. Like a doctor would use their microcomputer to schedule and bill patients, as well as keep their accounting records. Unfortunately, this market would also be the IBM PC sweet spot. But Apple can build on its head start by hitting some other customer needs that had started to surface in the market. The first one would be professionals and businesses looking for a more powerful computer for more intensive tasks like graphics and design. The second would be the corporate market. These are high-end users who need to run sophisticated calculations for experiments or computer-aided design. These are the users Sun Microsystems would eventually serve with their workstations. The Apple II was a monster hit. It was still a hit in 1982, a year after the IBM PC introduction and five years after its own, when it sold 600,000 units, the most in its history. But Apple struggled to come up with a successor. The Apple III, actually announced a year before the IBM PC back in May 1980, perfectly illustrated these struggles. By 1979, management, seeing the Apple II as quite old and in need of replacement, tried to offer the Apple III as a higher-end successor specifically made for businesses. With a faster microprocessor, Apple II emulation, and a full upper-lower case keyboard. But unlike with the Apple I and Apple II, the work of one man was. A committee led by Steve Jobs designed and built the Apple III. The result was a mutant compromise machine pushed out into the market in March 1981, way too early. The computer also cost between $4,340 to $7,800, but in 
a high price to pay considering that it shipped without some of its advertised features and suffered a 20% failure rate due to an overly ambitious design. Most notably, some of the chips in the computer fell out of their sockets. Management genuinely thought that the Apple II would vanish six months after the three came out, so they canceled or limited features that could have improved the Apple II, like a memory expansion, and even stopped mentioning the computer in their marketing. But despite several fixes, the Apple III sold only a tenth of the volume of its predecessor. So in 1981, Apple grudgingly went back to the two series and created the lower cost Apple IIe, marketed as an evolution. Released in January 1983, the $1,395 Apple IIe was a massive hit. It was very profitable thanks to a custom integrated chip that Apple would eventually produce for less than $100. Apple sold the Apple IIe for nearly 11 years, their longest lasting computer. There is a generation of Apple fans who grew up with this little computer. It kept Apple afloat as IBM surged ahead into the market share lead with 26% of the market and a massive 750,000 unit base. Apple eventually stopped offering the Apple III line after losing some $60 million on the whole venture. The mistake was to try to create a brand new computer to directly compete with the two. So naturally, they tried to do the same thing again with the Lisa. The Lisa began in 1978 as a set of specifications, a $2,000 computer for business users. That was far from how it ended up. It was inspired by the Xerox Alto, a beautiful computer used by the Xerox Park Research Lab. The Alto also inspired the Sun One workstation. But Apple refused to simply copy the Alto. They worked a long time, 200 person years in development, compared to the Apple II's two years, producing a unique user interface with a menu bar, pull down menus, overlapping windows, and scroll bars. These were truly special, but that meant that when the Lisa finally hit the market in January 1983, it cost way too much, about $10,000 to $12,000, or over $27,000 in 2021. If you squint hard at Apple's product development at the time, you could have seen the contours of a comprehensive lineup targeting the market's emerging segments. The Apple III for the professionals and small businesses, and the Lisa for the corporate and government users. Both the Lisa and the Sun One, Sun's popular workstation, used the same microprocessor, a powerful Motorola 68000, so it might have been capable of the task. But Sun One ran the popular Berkeley Unix operating system, onboarded a library of technical software, and thus became the workstation of choice for those engineers and professionals in need of more compute power. The Lisa never went beyond the seven applications with which they shipped. Developing those cost $20 million, nearly half of the project's total budget, and those applications taxed the processor so much to make the computer feel sluggish to use. So the Lisa fell into an awkward space, not powerful enough to be a workstation, but too expensive for professionals who would rather buy an IBM PC for about two to $5,000 to do their spreadsheets and word processing. Sadly, the Lisa never managed to gain the attention it deserved for its software and interface innovations, thanks to the Macintosh. The story of the Macintosh's creation is legendary, and there are some great resources you can pick up to learn about it, but the core story goes something like this. Original founder Jeff Raskin started the Macintosh project to produce an easy-to-use home computer that would cost about $500. So, if the Apple III was for pros and small business, and the Lisa was for corporate high computing, then the Macintosh would be for the person on the street, the people's computer for their home and maybe some gaming. Steve Jobs, still smarting from his removal from the Lisa project, came onto the Macintosh. Entering into a hellbent competition against the Lisa team, Jobs produces a milestone computer with a groundbreaking graphical interface. Reviewers at the time acknowledged the computer to represent the direction that desktop computers should go. Truly easy to use, an electronics appliance, and beautiful graphics. After the prominent failures of the Apple III and the Lisa, the company went all in on the Macintosh. Steve Jobs and new Apple CEO John Scully were supremely confident in their product, Jobs predicted that Apple would sell 50,000 Macs in the first 100 days after launch, and then half a million by the end of 1984. Apple put everything it had into marketing the Macintosh. Most everyone knows the world-famous 1984 ad, but the company pulled out all the stops. 
the Macintosh got more coverage than any other computer before. And it was indeed a great product, but the first Macintosh unfortunately lacked functional basics, like enough memory to run big programs and a disk drive to store data. It was also expensive. Remember, the original spec was to price the computer at $500. The final price with standard Apple markups and the expensive marketing campaign was $2,495. And finally, the Macintosh did not have IBM PC compatibility. This meant losing access to a third-party library of 3,000 plus program titles, and that increasingly was becoming the most important thing. By day 101, Apple had sold over 70,000 Macintoshes. The numbers beat Jobs' public claims, allowing Apple to call the Macintosh a huge success, but many of those sales were at discounted prices to universities. Worse yet, sales tapered off to about 20,000 units a month after the advertising campaign ended. Internally, the company was expecting to sell 60 to 85,000 units a month. And unfortunately, Apple invested a lot of money on building up the supply for all those sales. This includes millions of dollars spent in 1983 on a highly automated plant in Fremont, California. The holiday season over Christmas 1984 was particularly bad, though it didn't seem that way at first. The company generated $700 million in revenue, 100% growth, and a company record. But at a stock analyst meeting in early 1985, Apple broke out sales by product. And just 200 million of that were Macintoshes, Apple's lauded computer of the future. The forgotten, frequently disrespected Apple II produced $500 million. Wozniak had long been frustrated by the company's lack of respect for the Apple II cash cow, which he created and ran. So when he heard this news, he became furious and confronted John Scully about it. Unswayed by Scully's attempts to calm him, he left the company in April 1985 after a brief handover period. Afterwards, he told the press that Apple's direction has been horrendously wrong for five years. The Macintosh absorbed the Lisa division, growing from 100 people to over 1,000. By March 1985, Jobs was in a terrible mood over the Macintosh's lackluster sales, saying, Why isn't it selling? Things just aren't going right, and I can't figure out why. In the quarter after the $700 million blockbuster holidays, Apple reported $435 million in sales and just $10 million in net income. Income might have gone up, but the company found itself awash in unsold inventory. Apple had to shut down four factories for a week. The company's financial issues were getting more serious. A deteriorating macroeconomic situation in 1985 would trigger an 8% decline in the microcomputer industry, its first big downturn. IBM PCs did better shored up by their strength in the business market. Wall Street cut their Apple earnings estimates and the stock plunged. The company was tearing itself apart at the exact wrong time. The Macintosh people feuded and fought the Apple II people. Jobs was involving himself in messes around the company, leaving Scully to go clean them up. Then in early April, Scully found out that the Macintosh division had not yet finalized the second generation Mac eight months after its introduction, and that the company was running out of parts for the old Lisa computer, renamed to the Macintosh XL because Jobs never believed in the Lisa's design. The company wasn't pushing out any products in its fast-moving competitive field. The Macintosh team, exhausted from the initial development effort, was struggling to move forward. Scully finally decided that they could not survive with two power bases. In April, he went to the board and asked them to either remove Steve Jobs from an operational role or to accept Scully's resignation. The board backed Scully. Jobs tried to make nice for a few months, but was finally formally stripped of his titles in May 1985 after a failed coup attempt while Scully would be abroad in China. Shunted aside, Jobs finally resigned a few months later in September 1985. In an interview with the New York Times, Vice President and future board member Bill Campbell said, We've been without Steve Jobs for the better part of four months. Since that time, we've been doing just fine. Now with full control, Scully and his COO, Del Yocum, reorganized the company, merging the different product divisions to make functional teams. This eliminated the previous situation, where the respective marketing teams in the Macintosh and Lisa divisions targeted the same customer. Many people had to leave. 1,200 were laid off, and the company turned its first quarterly loss in history, thanks to the organization costs.
A great many of those who were not laid off went to Steve Jobs' new startup next. Apple was unhappy about that and threatened a lawsuit over it for a while before deciding the bad publicity wasn't worth it. And what to do about the Macintosh? In June 1985, Bill Gates and Microsoft suggested in a secret memo licensing out the operating system to computer makers like AT&T and Hewlett Packard. Apple ultimately turned this down after a fierce internal debate, but it would have been interesting to see how a licensed Macintosh OS would have performed in the market coming a few months ahead of Windows. Getting Macintosh sales back on track depended on the company finding a new killer app for it. The Apple II benefited from the VisiCalc, what would be the Macintosh's VisiCalc. For that, we need to wind the clock back a little bit. For a long time, Apple sold dot matrix printers to accompany its Apple II line, the Image Writer. It could print about 120 characters per second at a resolution of about 70 to 140 dots per inch. The Macintosh could use the Image Writer too, but the team felt that they needed to produce a new, higher resolution printer to more take advantage of their computer's graphical powers. So they partnered with Canon to produce the Laser Writer, a laser printer capable of printing at 300 dpi. This was the threshold at which people cannot easily discern individual pixels, same as for the retina screen. To allow users to consistently save and edit graphics files, Steve Jobs reached out to a small startup called Adobe. Adobe had a graphics programming language called PostScript that consistently described the appearance of a printed page regardless of the device. Apple integrated the language into the Macintosh. The LaserWriter printer cost nearly $7,000, so it was hard to imagine companies buying more than a few of them. So Apple created a product called Macintosh Office, a file server and networking product that allowed several users to share a single LaserWriter printer. Apple announced the Macintosh Office product in January 1985, a year after the Macintosh's introduction with a terrible commercial called Lemmings. The ad, which Scully hated but ad agency Chat Day loved, aired at the Super Bowl. It showed a bunch of suited businessmen walking towards a cliff and jumping over. Unlike the famous and iconic 1984 ad, Lemmings struck the exactly wrong tone. Businesses hated the implication that they were like Lemmings, which don't normally do this herding and cliff jumping behavior anyway. And as a result, Apple would not do another Super Bowl ad for over a decade. The Laser Writer got caught up in this bad start as well as the Macintosh's own declining sales numbers. Sales began in February 1985 with about 2,000 sold and then slowly declined to about 400 units per month. Sales were so low because there were not any applications capable of taking advantage of the Macintosh's advanced graphics or the Laser Writer's high resolution printing. Though I do want to note that the original Macintosh with its 128K of memory was hardly capable of running such a thing anyway. We needed to wait until later for a better product with more memory. In the summer of 1985, with Apple caught up in crisis, a young product marketing manager named John Skull, not John Scully, was given the task of saving the laser writer. Skull had little resources of his own and no one on his team except for a summer intern. He started by going around talking to software developers, Adobe, and electronic publishing companies. It was through these conversations that he started hearing about page layout, the design work for producing materials for publishing, things like newsletters and flyers. Back then, doing this would have required scissors and glue and maybe even some photography. Now you can do it all in the computer. Skull got to experience it firsthand watching Apple's in-house design team produce marketing materials for the Macintosh office. Skull thought this had high potential. After a few focus groups confirmed this use case, he started a project to develop and market it. Wanting to hit the autumn selling season, he wanted to get the whole thing done in a few months. He found a small WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, page layout application called PageMaker, made by the Aldis Corporation. He liked it and bundled it together with a few Macintoshes and a laser writer for Apple's distributors to sell. Skull didn't like the phase page layout and changed the name to Desktop Publishing at Aldis founder Paul Brainerd's suggestion. Aldis, Adobe, and Apple teamed up to train Apple's dealers in how to sell the use case and the bundle to their customers. A distributor would hold seminars to teach customers how desktop publishing works. A salesperson would then follow up shortly thereafter to sell the bundle. Sales turned around almost immediately. 
John Scully heard about the success and sought to orient the company towards his new, unique use case. The Macintosh was the only computer with this graphical interface and it soon captured 70% of the market. New software applications joined the fray. Aldous PageMaker was the first, but other notable programs include Cork Express, Microsoft Word, and of course, PowerPoint. By 1987, the industry had gone mainstream. A year after that, it became a billion-dollar global business. Apple's market share stabilized at about 8%. Its market share in the education field was over 50%. By 1990, Apple's sales surged to $5.6 billion, and the company enjoyed the highest margins in the industry. Apple had seemingly survived the invasion of the IBM PC into its market nine years prior, cultivating a high-end market based on its unique differentiation. Despite this, there were people at the company convinced that Apple's high margins could not last. Dan Eilers, VP of Strategy, felt that the company was on a, quote, glide path to history. Scully soon came to agree. He worried that Apple was increasingly viewed as the BMW of the computer industry. He nervously looked at the rapidly improving capabilities of the IBM compatibles, empowered by Microsoft's new operating system, Windows. So he decided that he needed to do whatever it took to bring Apple, quote, back on track, end quote. He anointed himself chief technology officer and sought to produce a new game-changing product of his own. Unfortunately, it would soon become a disaster. All right, everyone, that's it for tonight. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel, sign up for the newsletter, and I'll see you guys next time.